writing process is so much smoother now. How pleasing is that for you? Uh, well, it's it's nice. Um, you know, the first record was I pretty much made it myself in a dorm room, and you know, it's just Tyler and me. We sort of got a band together, and you know, everyone was kind of on different pages on stage, and you know, it took five years, but we really have a great grasp of each other and what we're doing musically. Um, Mikey's been playing guitar with us for six months, and I can't believe how fast he's learning. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah. it's, it's gotten smoother and faster too, which is yeah. noticeably good. noticeably better too live for sure. With this latest record, how would you characterize the mood overall from your standpoint? Uh, it's definitely a little bit more mellow than our previous records. Um, you know, it's more. I think it's more songwriting driven and more. Um, there's a lot more instrumental like jam parts than our pythons definitely had. Um, for when we started writing this one, we um, really had didn't have a clear idea of what we wanted from it. Um, which you know usually we write demos and rework songs to death, and this time we just sort of decided to stick with our instincts and our first draft and just move on from part to part and. Um, I think it's a sometimes like a somber record. I think it's a kind of a meandering record. Mm -hmm. But those are kind of, you know, kind of seem like a good, <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of like seemed like the right fit for us. To let it all hang out, was that a nice output for you guys? Yeah. Um, you know, we, I think we all tend to like, you know, the sadder, more sentimental songs, like from our favorite bands, um, you know, Pavement, Guided by Voices. They're, definitely have some some tear jerkers and um you know i i don't know i think I'm, I'm really proud of it i think it's a really emotional record and i think that most of my favorite m music is pretty emotional there's a lot of optimism throughout the record as well it's about entailing making a better life for yourselves and you know there's a lot more of an optimism was that a key outlook for this album absolutely um you know after the whirlwind of you know, people knowing who our band was and traveling all over the world, getting signed to a major label and all sorts of personal stuff along the way. It, you know, it was, you know, I kind of realized that, you know, if I want to be happy and I want to do this long term, I'm going to have to, um, you know, I'm going to have to figure out how to do that. And that's not just, no one else can do that for you. So, mm -hmm. you know, I moved to, I moved to California. I lived in Florida for 25 years and I've been living with my girlfriend there for an hour and it's been a strange and slow adjustment, but um, my personal life is in a pretty good place right now and I'm happy and I think that writing music and touring is all easier when you're in a stable place. What led to the, to the decision of straying away from three to five minute pop songs and with bridges and you know traditional songwriting structures, what, what, what made you stray away from that? Uh, I think the pressure of having to write songs like that was sort of what made me kind of a little disillusioned with that. And I understand that, you know, format's important and people gravitate towards things that are familiar, but um, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with having a chorus and a bridge, but that said, I think, yeah, on a major label, if they hear a song that doesn't have that, they can start to worry, because that's what they're used to, the format being. and. Uh, we recorded this record without a record label at the time. We had just been dropped by Warner, and we were funding it ourselves. We were writing it at uh, some friend's house in uh, Portland while they were on tour, friend's band. And, uh, and yeah, I think we were able to just take time to ourselves and really figure out where the song should go. And mm -hmm. we jammed a lot of late nights, and sometimes the jams stayed in the songs, too, where yeah. we weren't trying to cut it out. There, there are a few songs with like extended jam endings. Let's talk about some of the material on the album, Sabretooth and Bone. Tell us about this song entailing a theme that runs throughout the record about being sustainable both musically and romantically. How, how does that come into play? Uh, well, you know, after pulling a stunt like signing to Warner Brothers and trying to have your songs on American FM radio and realizing that that was all kind of a crapshoot anyway. I mean, all of my favorite bands are, you know, didn't become popular overnight. Bands like Yola Tango and have, they've been touring forever and they're still not playing, you know, Brixton or anything when they come to London, but they're, 
awesome bands who consistently put out good music and they're the bands that I love the most so it seemed you know it seemed like that's the kind of band I wanted to be and, and they, they, some of the elements influenced this record also you mentioned you know the interludes and the outros that you did and it's what you all the tingle are so good at so consistently and that kind of seeped into this record as well didn't it very much so yeah thank you for noticing <laughs> tell us about point of no return Here's a song I know is very personal in telling the unfortunate, you know, struggles that Thomas has. And, you know, what was it like for you to write something, pen something like this? I mean, it must have been such, what was it like for you? Well, now it's kind of scary because this was before we had any news that Tom's, you know, health had, was suffering at all. Um, so, you know, I just kind of wrote it about how, you know, how Tom's managed to be so positive the whole time he's been playing music with me even though I know that this has always been in the back of his mind and then when this happened looking back it is you know it's eerie in a way um and the writing of that song started with uh, a riff that he was playing too it was, yeah he had he this wrote it around a riff he had a simple a simple guitar part that we sort of expanded into into a longer song mm -hmm. um yeah it's Feels weird. What was it like for you guys to put your spin on Outcast's Hey Ya? I mean, it was a really worked out so well. What was it like for you guys as a challenge? Well, to be honest, you know, I was a little nervous about the idea at first and kind of didn't want to do it. Um, you know, that's a pretty anthemic song, and it was. I figured it'd be kind of hard to to top it. I kind of got the idea to do that when I went to when Thomas got married last November. Um, they played that song at the um, uh, the reception to his wedding and everybody just went nuts and everyone was in the ninth grade again and I'm like oh wow like this really is such a great song and I figured um is it the drifters who do this magic moment that you know the, the version I'm talking about that has like all those swells I think there's like a reverse guitar on it really early on but I was like what if I took that song and sort of did that with it and um when Amazon approached us about it we were like well might as well try. The worst thing we can do is fail and not never put it out and it turned out cool. With regards to live shows, how do you feel your live shows have evolved over the time? You know, How would you assess the development of your live shows with three albums mm -hmm. under the belt? Well, one thing I've noticed lately is we're much more comfortable with the quiet parts. I remember when we first started, if we weren't playing loud and banging our heads and, you know, had our amps up to 10, we didn't feel comfortable on stage. We felt like we weren't giving people enough. And now we, the quiet parts are really quiet and it feels actually, this was like my favorite moments now in a way. Um, when they used to make me, you know, I used to freak out that we weren't putting enough energy into it or something. So uh -huh. I think it's definitely more dynamic and that probably means it's more interesting to watch now Absolutely. than it's been. If you guys could go back in time to see one performance, who would it be? Ooh. Oh God! <laughs> I would say uh, I would have either uh, the Clash or uh, Fugazi. Yeah, I would go back and see Fugazi. I think if I could, just because, or maybe Fugazi or the Smiths, because I know those are two bands who will just never <laughs> reunite, no matter. What no matter how much festivals want to pay them to get back together and play the the classics, they'll never get back together. So, two bands I really wish I could have seen.